To those of you that just joined us, good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Autism and the Skilled Trades. My name is Ryan Raposa and I'm your host for today's event. It's great having you all. I would now like to introduce our presenter, Danny Combs. Danny is the president and founder of Teaching the Autism Community Trades, TACT, a nonprofit that teaches individuals with autism trade skills. After 10 years in the music industry, he began to cultivate his passion for education by teaching private lessons and running his music program at an inner city high school in Nashville, Tennessee. He was granted several awards in teaching, including a Grammy Enterprise Award for the program he designed in the Nashville schools. He also became a published educational author, arranger, and songwriter. Danny has a master's degree in education, is a board certified cognitive specialist and a certified autism specialist. Danny is the board chair and president of the Autism Society of Colorado and an airman in the Air Force Reserve in space operations. He has two children, Dylan and Ellie. When his son Dylan was diagnosed with autism, he pulled from his family legacy and put together TAC. So without further ado, here is Danny Combs. Danny, take it away. Thank you so much, Ryan, and thank you everyone for attending. Um, we're really looking forward to this. So um, I hope that you guys find today's presentation engaging and fun. And I put my contact information um, right on the very first slide. Um, I'm a pretty approachable person, so I would encourage any of you that have any questions after this or any time in the future, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. My email address is right there. It's danny at buildwithtax.org. Um, there's additional contact information as far as phone numbers and whatnot if you want to call um, at buildwithtax.org. Um, again, I'm a pretty approachable person, so I hope you guys can reach out. Um, I would love to talk to you about it. So um, I'm delighted to talk to you about the future of autism in, in the skilled trade specifically. Um, there's a huge opportunity that we have for our children um, with autism. I wanted to, to kind of piggyback off what Ryan started to tell you a little bit about me and why I'm doing this and why I started TACT and got involved in our incredible community. And then um, we'll hopefully answer some questions if you guys have any at the very end of the presentation. So I'm going to talk about kind of where autism is, where the trades are at, how our program works here at TACT, and then kind of go from there. So Ryan, if we could go to the next slide, please. So, um, and you can go to the next part too, Ryan. I apologize since it will populate there. Thank you. Um, fancy movements there. Um, so TACT is a 501c3 here in Denver, Colorado. I started this organization in 2016, um, inspired by my son, Dylan. Um, the goal of what we're trying to do is encourage and empower the full spectrum of individuals with autism through education and employment in the skilled trades. Um, when my son was diagnosed with autism, and I find out, probably like some of you that are on this, um, that there is a 90% chance of under unemployment. Um, that was terrifying to me. Um, right, you can go to the next slide. So um, my background, as Ryan mentioned, was um, in the trades. I grew up, well, my great-grandfather worked for a company called Grumman. So those of you in the East Coast might be familiar with Grumman. Later became North of Grumman. And my grandfather was an airman in the Air Force, worked for Grumman and designed uh, planes for the Navy. And then my father was a general contractor and I grew up swinging a hammer and working and just kind of thought everybody did those kind of things. And then, um, you know, naturally when you're fourth generation, you decide I'm gonna go to Nashville and play guitar for a living. And um, I did, and I was very, very fortunate that it worked and um, life was good there. And I loved everything that I was doing. Um, not as happy as I am now though. And um, my son was born in 2009 and um, he changed my life for the better. And um, when we found out that um, he had autism, we started looking for programs that were strengths-based programs. Many of you probably in this time today are therapists or work with therapy groups and God bless you because you guys do an amazing job. And I spent a number of hours in therapy centers and therapy organizations working with my son. And while they did all great things, I was always hearing things that he needed to improve on. And I never heard anything that was strengths-based on him. Could have just been my experience. And started seeing that he had all of these amazing gifts. And um, 
specifically in the way that he looked at the world and can visualize and conceptualize and actually manufacture these incredible three-dimensional objects. So um, I started looking for a trades-based program. It was my family background, right? And um, couldn't find anything and had the chance to meet the amazing Dr. Temple Grandin and said, hey, I've got this idea for a trades program to teach skilled trades to individuals with autism. And she loved it and said, stop what you're doing and go do it. So we always joke and say that Temple told us to because like, she was the um, one that finally pushed me to do it. So I give her a lot of credit. She's since become a, an amazing friend um, and keeps in touch all the time. She's been a really good supporter for us. So um, that's what we do here at TACT. We work towards getting individuals with autism jobs. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But um, it's been pretty successful. So I'm hoping to share with all of you on the call today. Um, I'm an open book. Um, I look at everything as the perspective of a parent. So I'm looking at it like it's gonna, the change that our community needs is gonna come from the ground up. So um, I'm happy to share in any way that I possibly can. Um, Ryan, if you don't mind going to the next slide, please. Um, so it kind of breaks my heart to say that from everything we've been told, we're the um, first and only ones in the country doing this. Um, we've learned a lot. We're in our fifth year right now and um, we have learned a ton. We are working with organizations like Children's Hospital that collects third-party data for us, where we're trying to get as much information as possible um, in third-party data to authenticate what we're doing and saying works. Um, we're hoping that more people jump on board, so maybe you guys will. Um, I wanted to go over kind of the future of what autism is looking like in our community right now. Ryan, if you don't mind going to the next slide, please. Um, and so I'm going to kind of go over some different things that you guys might be aware of that's kind of in the state of um, our country and the world. Um, a lot of the references in, in my PowerPoint, um, which you guys can download, I have references for all of these statistics. So I would encourage you to go back and look at everything I'm telling you. You can see that um, there's a point of reference for all of it. Um, so the next slide, please, Mr. Uh, Ryan there. So attacked we start things pretty young um, and you're going to see that most programs um, are very very specialized at the k-8 to level um, third and fourth grades um, are getting a ton i know that from a parent there's lots of things out there for this age but we're finding as we get to the transition age um, there's less there right and parents are kind of burnt out and tired and don't really know what to do at that point because they've been getting all of these different things in place uh, for their young kids and as we start getting closer and closer to that workforce age um, there's less in place Ryan the next slide please um, so a lot of you know that if you're working with um, young adults or have a child on the spectrum yourself that um, IDA or IDA requires students with um, autism spectrum disorder to have a transition plate transition plan in age by age 14 um, that's essentially eighth grade, right? So eighth grade going into ninth grade for high school, um, that's supposed to be in place. Uh, Ryan, the next part too, I apologize. Um, and what you'll see is that only 58% of kids right now um, are getting that. Um, and that's even not even having it implemented, right? So we've got a big part of our population, which we're gonna talk about, um, that is supposed to have a transition plan specifically as it gears towards transition into employment. Um, I'm not really going to talk about as much transition into like day treatment centers or things like that that's happening a lot right now because the whole goal of what we're trying to do and I'm hoping you that have joined us today is kind of transition into employment and this huge opportunity within the skill trades for that. Um, Ryan the next slide please sir. So um, the, the tragic thing about all of this and again there's studies for all of this is showing that eighth grade right before they go into high school um, is where the lowest amount of um, kind of programs are in place if you will that are actually supporting our kids to start getting this transition plan in place um, it's kind of um, devastating to, to see that um, ryan the next plan please sir that's a car by the way that our students restored it was a 19 um, a little bit more please mr ryan to the full next slide please that our students actually did um so right now it's looking like in the next decade that we're gonna have about 500,000 um children young adults um with autism spectrum disorder kind of age out of the school system or the transition program right here in colorado 
um, services go to age 21. Um, I know that in some states, it's actually that it'll go through age 21. So that might be, you might be fortunate that your state does that. It seems like different states interpret it, whether it's through age 21 or to age 21. Here in Colorado, it's to age 21. Um, Ryan, the next slide, please. Um, but um, as a parent, it should probably be asking like, oh my gosh, what's happening next? Um, so most parents feel like this, right? When you get to age where well, your kid is 18, 21, they're, you're pretty much on your own at that point, unless you're gonna navigate some of the things that we're gonna talk about, which are super tricky to navigate. Um, Ryan, the next slide, please. So um, what ends up happening is that after high school, um, more than half of individuals with autism had no job or post-secondary education. Um, and what we'll talk about too is when, even when an individual with autism goes to college, the actual odds of them increasing to get a job, it only increases by, goes from a 90% under or unemployment rate to an 85% under unemployment rate. And to think of actually spending all the money that college costs right now, especially in these COVID times to do it online learning, um, it's kind of um, not very beneficial. It's not seem like it's really, really working. Uh, Ryan, next slide, please, sir. Um, so most of you uh, might know that um, if you're a parent or you're a therapist or a doctor and you're working with kids on the spectrum or teacher, that the autism community has a 90% under or unemployed rate. It's the highest in the country of any group. Um, it's this huge portion of our population that nobody is talking about. And it's kind of terrifying to think that we have all these incredibly talented men and women out there that have so much to offer and 90% of them um, aren't, aren't getting jobs, um, let alone actual careers with room for advancement. So one of the things that I'd like to talk to you all about today is the difference between a job that is sometimes presented through organizations that are very well-meaning versus actually having a career, right? Because in my mind and my goal and what I'd love to extend to all of you is the opportunity for our kids to have careers and fulfilling lives that make them happy. Um, where they find self-fulfillment and you get a chance to see your child or if you're the individual with autism watching this that you get the chance to actually flourish so um, ryan the next slide please i wanted to kind of talk to you all about how much um, this costs um, especially for taxpayers right and you as a parent sorry mr ryan I don't know if you heard me say check the next slide i know there's sometimes there's some latency there uh, one more, please, sir. Great. So um, this is the number of um, money, according to um, a big publication. Actually, um, I wonder if this was in the UK. And this one's actually in the United States, United, um, UK and United States, um, that a family will spend on a quote-unquote neurotypical child, um, including the cost of college, right? So from birth through 21, this is about how much money you'll end up spending. Um, that's a pretty big chunk of change. Um, and if you're kind of like me, no one tells you that when you have kids. So when you see those kind of things, um, it's it, it's overwhelming, it, it's a lot. Um, the next slide, please, Mr. Ryan. Um, so for an individual with autism, um, the lifetime cost, it, it's about a million and a half, just shy of that $1.4 million for um, the cost. Now, what ends up happening here in Colorado, for example, the average expect or fees per year for different services is about $100,000 per year um, per family. The median household income in the state of Colorado is $53,000 a year. So if you figure that a family is spending twice, the average family is spending twice their annual income on one of their children's services alone before they buy a loaf of bread or a jug of milk, that's, well, that's a lot of money. It puts a lot of families in a lot of places where they're in an uncomfortable financial position, the children or young adult isn't getting the services they need, and um, nobody's winning from that. And that's not a very, very, very good place to be. Um, so one of the big proponents and one of the reasons we push education so much, specifically education in the skilled trades towards that career, is it really, and I hope to show you in a few minutes, will alleviate a lot of that. Uh, Mr. Ryan, the next slide, please. So a lot of times, and if any of you work with individuals with autism, you know that um, 
there's no such thing as an individual just autism. A lot of times there is an intellectual developmental disability or delay that will go with that. Um, and different states, which we'll talk about in the Q&A, have different approaches to kind of how they classify that and fund that. Um, even in Colorado, it's different county to county. Um, the next part of this slide, please, Mr. Ryan. Um, and so once that is actually included, you can see that it adds another million dollars, right? So it's incredibly expensive, um, right, on, on a parent, right? And the goal of a parent is, right, we want our children to be happy, right? We want our kids to have fulfilling lives. We want all of those things that parents want. If you're working with kids a lot, you want the same thing for your clients, right? I mean, that's the humanity to it. Um, so just to kind of point this out, um, the current cost of ASD are, are more than double the cost of a stroke or hypertension or cost of other, of like diabetes, for example. So again, it's this huge portion of our, our population and these families and these individuals have this huge financial burden, um, but nobody talks about that, right? I mean, if you look at everything that's going on in our country right now, no one is talking about this. This would be such a wonderful platform to kind of start making aware what our children and our families and a big portion of them in our country are going through right now um, and trying to do the best part for their um, life. Uh, the next slide, Mr. Ryan. So this unbelievably staggering number, I wish I could say was just a random number that I made up. Um, sadly, I didn't. It actually came from the cost of the autism spectrum disorders in the United Kingdom and the United States in JMJA Pediatrics. And um, again, the reference is all on the slides. You can see this is what it's costing us, right? As a culture and society, this is a whole bunch of money um, that we could be using towards working towards getting our kids um, jobs, right? Or changing our society. Mr. Ryan, the next slide, please, sir. And even yet a uh, scarier number, right? So um, I wanted to show you these just because part, I think, of my whole idea with um, teaching the individuals with autism trades is to kind of bring them out just where we're at, right? So these are numbers that are taking place currently and how the opportunity uh, that we have by starting to employ this incredibly talented group of people and actually give them the skills and the supports they need to have these careers and what the value of the trades in this is, um, it will change all of this. So, I mean, if you think of the economic impact by actually supporting people will have, it's a pretty amazing feat. Uh, Mr. Ryan, the next part. Um, I just wanted to kind of give you guys a quote of just um, what we think we should be doing, right? Um, Mr. Ryan, the next slide, please, sir. So, um, if not college, right? So, um, I went to college, I'm guessing most of you did. I have a master's degree as well. Um, I love learning and I think, you know, college is great, not putting it down, but we're just not pushing trades at all. Um, some of you might most recently have seen um, TAP was featured on Mike Rowe's show, um, Returning the Favor, and Mike Rowe is a great advocate for the skill trades. We share in common the idea that the skill trades offer and are not promoted an incredible opportunity for advancement, careers, a lot of money. Um, most people don't realize just how much money people in the skill trades make. And especially now that the baby boomers are aging out and retiring, um, it's, it's a pretty amazing opportunity, right? So, I mean, you've got, and we'll talk more about it, this huge field that's actively hiring that our kids are well suited for and are ready to go. Mr. Ryan, uh, the next slide, please. I'm gonna kind of dive into the skill trades. And when I'm talking about the skill trades, I'm talking about everything, in case you aren't aware of what the skill trades are, everything from auto mechanics to welders, to plumbers, to carpenters, to pipe fitters, to um, people doing drywall, to electricians, to uh, people paving our roads, anybody that is doing kind of what the last COVID crisis brought as essential workers. Um, the amazing thing about our program here at TACT is we've actually gotten more kids jobs than pre during COVID than pre-COVID where employers are still growing and they're still hiring more and more people because we need more people to keep getting these jobs. Um, the next slide, please, Mr. Ryan. So this is the incredible Dr. Temple Grandin. If you have never read any of her books or seen the movie that HBO made about her or seen any of her TED Talks, I would highly encourage you to. She's an incredible human being. Um, 
So she's also a worker in the trades. Um, she's been a big advocate for TACT and um, she's become a dear friend that we um, have done some stuff together with. Um, she thinks that roughly 25% um, could be of individuals' lessons could be placed in the skilled trades. You figure that we have a 90% unemployment gap. If we brought that down, if she's right and what we're trying to do here at TACT and if you all join in and we start working all together towards placing individuals with autism into the skilled trades, if we brought that down 25% by getting all these incredible people jobs, that would be astronomical. I mean, it would be a huge um, benefit um, to everybody. Um, Mr. Ryan, the next slide, please, sir. Um, so the skill trades are actually um, incredibly well suited. And I'm going to talk to you guys about why that is and why part of the reason we've been so successful, I believe, and why you can too, um, in getting individuals um, placed in the spectrum. Those of you that are employers that are listening to this, wanting to hire kids with the spectrum, 60 Minutes just did a great thing on it as well, if you can see it. Can you play the next portion of the slide, please, Ryan? Um, but what's happening right now is, and again, I wish I made up this number that I didn't, that you have 62% of firms that are working in the skilled trades are already performing or reporting a shortage of people that know how to do it. Um, the amazing thing about this is the income that's brought from this. Uh, so here at, in Denver, here's an example. In Denver, um, the minimum wage is $12.85 an hour. In the state of Colorado, it's a dollar less. It's $11.85 an hour. You guys will know what it is in your state. Um, tragically, our state still has a sub-minimum wage uh, for it, people with disabilities or intellectual and developmental delays. And that's kind of crazy in my, in my mind to think that we're still allowing individuals with disabilities or autism or um, any kind of neurodiverse um, population to be paid less. TACT is getting them jobs at over $10 more than the minimum wage because on average, because the skilled trades pay more than that. And likewise, there's actually room for advancement in careers. So it's astounding to think that there's this whole huge pool of jobs out there that's hiring talented people that pays really well, that recognize the talents and skills of our community, and they can actually take care of themselves and have a great life doing it. Um, it's pretty cool. Uh, next slide, please, Mr. Ryan. So right now, um, they are forecasting by the end of uh, 2025, the amount of baby boomers retiring will leave 31 million open positions. So I just referenced that in the next decade, there's 500,000 individuals with autism graduating of high school. Here's 31 million possible jobs. Um, so it's gonna present the option of genuine choice into what our community would like to do for work, which is super cool to think that our kids will actually get the chance to choose authentically what they wanna do in the trades. If it's, if they want to, you know, houses, if they want to rebuild engines, if they want to weld bridges, there's all these opportunities out there for them to do that. Uh, next slide, please, Mr. Ryan. So this is just a great reference for you guys and all the positions that are actually open um, or coming available. So um, I'm willing to bet some of you listening to this work in these fields, know somebody that does, um, had a grandparent do it, a family member, a neighbor, church member, whatever, that are working in these fields, there's tons of opportunities um, in, in all of these. And it's just good to look at it and say, okay, these are opportunities that are hiring people with without a college degree. You don't need that college degree. And what I'm going to talk about is a lot of them aren't even requiring certifications. They're looking for people that know how to work. And to think that you could step into a well above middle class job into a very, very six-figure type job with no college debt, um, not having to have that degree, the advancement that will give you for the future is its pretty amazing. Um, the next slide, please, Mr. Ryan. So in Colorado, um, the unemployment rate was at 2.8%. Um, honestly, during COVID, it has changed a little bit since I put this in there. So COVID has, um, has, has changed it a little bit. It is a little bit higher, but Colorado has actually done um, remarkably well, but um, giving you an idea of just how good um, these are. Um, Mr. Ryan, next slide, please. So um, there's tons and tons of people out there 
that will talk about the fact that the economy is strong here in Colorado, for example. Um, if you're in the Denver area or you're more in the western slope or even south in Colorado Springs, everybody is moving to our state. So there's constantly room for growth. The, the economy is strong and I'm willing to bet that in a lot of your states as well. It's the same type thing, but trying to find people that know how to do these jobs. People aren't going into it. Uh, the next slide, please, Mr. Ryan. So I wanted you guys to see, um, just again, kind of like what trade workers are saying. Um, there's an example of, of a company we work with um, called CPI, and they manufacture credit cards. Um, they're one of only four ins um, installations. The next part of the slide, too, please, Mr. Ryan. Um, that actually um, make credit cards. It's a secure facility. You have to have special clearances to get in, all these different things, right? They hired one of our individuals um, with autism to work at the factory making credit cards. They were so impressed, a month later they came to us and said, can we have 30 more? Literally 30 more. And so it's astounding to think that a company would hire somebody with autism, they recognize that. Now, mind you, us getting that process set up, you're breaking down barriers, right? You're changing minds, you're opening hearts, you're actually getting to the part where like people are starting to see. And then once they witness it for themselves and they're able to not look at those stereotypes that they've heard before, they recognized how much better it made their workplace. Um, so these are just some quotes from some different trade workers. So this is kind of what we do here at TACT. And this is, I think, um, what makes our place so special. Uh, next part, Mr. Ryan. Um, so we're here at TACT and part of our um, mission and vision is we envision a world where neurodiversity is not only embraced but valued inherently. A world where the full spectrum of autism community can contribute their talents and gifts to find personal fulfillment. And that's what we're trying to do, right? That's what we actually are wanting to do. Um, I think we're succeeding and I'm, I'm hoping you guys can join us in it. The next part, Mr. Ryan. Um, so these are a whole bunch of different skills that you get at TACT, which is kind of cool. Um, so we do everything from career exploration, job skills training, hands-on learning, sensory and adaptive environment, individualized curriculum, motor skills, development appropriate, design curriculum, all these different things um, are things that we are providing, independent living skills. Now here's the amazing thing, and we're going to talk about it more in a sec when I go into it. We're not segregating out these different programs. What happens a lot in autism is everything is segmented and segregated into, okay, today we're going to teach you how to do this skill. The amazing thing about the trades is even in like our overall nation's career technical education standards, they recognize that the trades are holistic in the sense that if you're going to be a carpenter, you have to have math skills, you have to be moving around, there's going to be a kinesthetic component, you have to have the socialization skills to communicate with your fellow coworkers, how it works. All of that comes together. We're not segmenting it and breaking it down like, let's teach you how to talk to your coworker. It comes together at the same time. So, um, and then we're going to talk more about that in a sec, but it, it's pretty amazing when you actually see how it comes together. The next part, Mr. Ryan. So this is kind of the tech, our tech programming. And the next slides or two slides are gonna be the ugliest slides I have in the presentation. Um, but just to kind of give you an idea of how I think and would recommend you set up. So this actually has the most valuable information in my mind, even despite it's the uh, unprettiest slide of them all. Um, so at TACT, we start kids at age five. That doesn't mean we put you know, a welding torch or a kid under a car at age five. That's not what I'm saying but we want kids to be exposed to the idea of working at the trades. So we have workshops, we have summer camps, we've got one-on-one -on -one lessons where a kid can come in and experience a makerspace class, a circuitry class, an audio engineering class to see if they like it. They're not getting it in public schools and if they've never been exposed to it, how are they gonna know if they like it? So we want to actually start exposing kids and recording that interest because when we get to that age of 14 where all of a sudden we're putting with IDA a transition plan in place. If we have a history of experience and exposure, then school districts and government agencies are that much more likely to fund what we're doing and what you guys will hopefully be doing. Um, again, it's holistic, right? It's teaching all of these things at once. Most autism groups, they break it all down. We're not doing that. And so when we're using these work skills, what we're teaching the trades, 
not all of our students end up going into the trades. Some of them want to work at a coffee house. Some of them want to work in their parents' office or in an office building. Um, that's fine, but we're learning work skills, right? We're learning how to show up on time, how to communicate, how to work with a team, how to work with different aspects of executive functioning to be a valuable employee, right? If you talk to most employers, they'll tell you they want people that are honest, dependable, will show up on time, ask if they have questions. We're using the trades to do this. It's a vessel at the end of the day. Um, one of the things that we do is we have an amazing staff. That's a big part of it that are student focused. We want them to be invested in the kids. We never have more than six students per class. We have over 700 kids attacked. We have classes that go on all day, every day, especially when you only have six kids in a class. We always have two um, students per class, excuse me, two teachers per class. The idea is we want to have the ratio right to support our community, right? If there's a trade school that teaches the whole community here in the Denver, Colorado area, they have between 30 and 60 kids per class in an automotive class with two teachers. I don't know about you guys, but I would not feel comfortable with 60 kids in a class, two teachers, even if it was 30 kids per class, and there's 30 cars in the air, and you have 30 kids underneath the cars that are up in the air and lifts, and they're pulling on things and taking things apart. I don't know how you how you would do that, and that's not fair to the teachers. It's not fair to the students. Nobody wins from that. Um, so um, we do things, too, where when we're setting up the projects at first. We call it deception without deceit. And what I mean from that is when you're developing projects for our kids to learn, it's not just opening a textbook and saying the old fashioned chapter seven learning of, okay, kids today we're doing chapter one and then tomorrow's chapter two and then tomorrow's chapter three and so forth. We're setting up projects that are teaching skills. So it takes a lot of time that are teaching the same skills, but they get the choice in what project they're doing, right? So we call it deception without deceit in the sense that if they're building a box or they're building a chair, and all of them have the same pieces, you're assembling those same pieces into different projects, it gives them the choice to actually choose what they want to make and empowers them at that point, but they're learning the skills that you want them to do. So you're still maintaining that control as an educator, but you're also then developing those skills. And then we use permanent projects. So those of you that are therapists are very, very aware of permanent projects where we actually set it up where we want to kind of study their progress, right? We keep copies and then towards the end of semesters or quarters, we'll end up going back and having them build similar projects so we can compare and have something tangible. And that tangible something as we develop portfolios for our clients is a big part of their success, which you'll see. Um, our environment is set up for success. So we call our place, our whole facility a simulation site. We don't call it a classroom where if you walked into our garage right now, you guys would see that it looks just like a professional garage. There's welding torches, there's table saws, there's car lifts, there's tons of tools everywhere. But it's set up too where there's iPads close by where they have TAs or there are things that are color coded or there's um, shadow boards in the wall for tools, different goes, different things that in, is a classroom, but it's also a workshop. So you can kind of see how it ends up coming together. Um, Ryan, the next slide, please. And then um, we always do our classes never more than 90 minutes. So we actually want people to have um, the idea that um, they can achieve something in a small amount of time and then take it home. A lot of our kids call it you know, their trophies. Um, again, I can't stress enough how much having the right staff is. Um, we always have our whole model as part of, part of it is having a trade professional with a special education um, teacher in the same classroom. So if we have somebody that's a retired skilled trades professional working with a special education professional, um, then they can work together and actually ends up developing this beautiful relationship where um, if it's a behavioralist or an RBT or a therapist, they can work together with that uh, actual teacher. It's kind of cool. So we do that with our developing program, right? Not even into our transition program. So these are all the things we're doing to get kids exposed before we jump into that transition program. Um, Ryan, the next slide. And this is an important thing that I want to show showcase to you guys. And we're going to talk about as we talk about our career tracks program. So. There's an organization here, and these um, were studies done by Colorado State University um, called Blue Star Recyclers. They're an incredible group, and 
part of our pitch to employers, and we'll talk about it more in a couple slides, is that when our students get jobs, our clients get jobs, they have less turnover, they're absent less, they have less on-time accidents, and their on-clock and um, task engagement is more, right? So I mean, looking at this, you look at that, if you can hire somebody, if you're an organization that is looking to hire individuals with autism, if you could think that you have a chance of hiring somebody, they have less than a 10% chance of turnover, they're gonna be absent almost never, and then there's less accidents on the job, and then their on-clock engagement is 98.43% versus 49% of the average um, US worker. That's pretty amazing. Um, I mean, if you just look at this graph, again, this was done by Colorado State University, you can see that what they're experiencing there and what our employers that we get kids jobs in um, are experiencing the same thing, that saves the organization money. So we have a whole pitch, which I'm gonna share with you guys that we do with our employers when we're getting them jobs. You can hear the tools in the background right now as I'm talking to you. But we measure all kinds of things, dependability, engagement, um, motivation, attendance, the work quality, the productivity, the adaptability. Um, we want employers to see that our kids are exceptional and it makes their workforce better. Um, Mr. Ryan, next slide, please, sir. So that's where our career tracks, which most people call it a transition program, takes place. So for those of you that are uh, most interested in that, I encourage you to take a look at, a, again, a not pretty slide, but give you some hopefully good information of how we go about it. Um, the next slide, Mr. Ryan. So after we've done the whole exposure piece, which we just talked about, the 90-minute classes, the six kids or six students per class with the two teachers, this is what we do. So we go out to employers and we talk to all of these skilled trades employers and we say, what do you need? Because there's always a shortage, right? Remember 62% of employers in skilled trades are reporting shortages right now. So we find out what they need. And then when we come to TACT, then we are training through our transition program exactly the skills those employers need. Most of you have read countless studies talking about when you go to college, by the time you graduate college, the market's already changed so much, everything that you just learned is no longer valuable. We're training to go specifically for what that job needs, right? So it's real and authentic. We're practicing, we set it up just like it is in their um, shop. So again, it's a simulation, right? It's a simulation shop. Um, and then when we do that for a period of time, there's no like, hey, let's do auto 101 and auto 102 and then auto 103. It's we're training, getting ready for the job. It makes it real. And then when we do that and we feel like the um, client or the student is ready for it, then they step into that employment, right? And then what happens is an employer gets an individual that's already trained and ready for work. Because what we found is as talented as our community is, that initial onset of that training goes slower. So employers in the past have looked at that initial training and seen that it's gone slower and become frustrated, not hired as many of our kids. So once they see that it's incredibly they're incredibly efficient once they're trained, then they succeed. The employer's happy, they wanna hire more. So they do that training here at TACT, they step into the workforce and they're ready to go. And then the employer gets somebody that's got a higher retention rate, that is better on task performance. It's a complete showcase of their skill and talent. And it's most importantly, it saves the company money, right? Because that's what they're looking for. If it's a for-profit organization, they're wanting to save money. So if they get somebody that knows it and is trained for it, they save money and they're happy and they want to hire more of our kids. So we're doing that hands-on training again here. So we always send job coaches with them as well. Um, we always want somebody to kind of be a liaison. We're also training the employers on what autism is. Um, we want employers to see our kind of neurodiverse community as the beauty that it really is. And so there's some language that we teach them. There's some different things that are set up. Now, here's what's kind of amazing about all of this is in the trades, there's already been so many different language barriers that the trades are already naturally set up for individuals. Since we teach the full spectrum, some of our kids choose alternative forms of communication. Um, there's already in the trades things set up for kids that are, there's different language barriers. So it's color coded, it's done by pictures, things are labeled in ways when you look at the blueprints, where if you can't speak English or if you're choosing alternative forms of communication, you can understand it. It's the infrastructure's already there. I mean, it's amazing. Um, 
so it's working well. I'd love to answer more questions about this. Um, Mr. Ryan, next slide, sir. And I know we're coming on um, 45 minutes. So I want to um, make sure we have some time for Q&A. Um, so again, um, that most employers have already kind of embraced the language barriers. And we're going, again, with career level income as far as like this you know, job placement where people are getting placed into bagging groceries or rolling napkins or stuffing envelopes. And some individuals, that might be what they want. And that's great. But we're trying to give a position that rewards talent and performance and actually has actual advancement. The trades do that. And there's so many openings. Uh, Mr. Ryan? Um, so we're an asset based in the next portion of this slide, too, uh, Mr. Ryan, um, versus deficit based. Again, when I talked about when we set up TACT, it was skills based, it was talent based, right? So we are looking at the strengths of the individual. Um, we're looking at the opportunities that are available and we're intentionally focused on actually getting them placed in those positions. For you, those of you that are parents that are watching this or advocates and you're wondering, how do I get my client or my child a job? Hopefully you'll learn from this, how we're doing it and we're being successful in it. And I hope that you can use that as well um, to help your child or, or client um, be successful. Um, Mr. Ryan, we're going to go through the next few slides a little more quickly here, um, just kind of going over the environment of our space. I just wanted to show you guys some pictures. Um, next slide, um, please, Mr. Ryan. So safety is a big part of what we teach. Safety has to be important. So whether our kids are, um, you know, using screwdrivers or nail guns or table saws, you can see we've got pictures of things. Everything's out um, for it as well. Um, and next one, please, Mr. Ryan. Um, so we have, have verbal and uh, written things. Our space, when you see our environment, we have it looks like Google, right? When you go to Google out there, it looks something similar where we have swings, we've got a sensory room, we've got weighted blankets, we've got all these different things for individuals to kind of um, feel comfortable if they need it. Um, so the last part of what I wanted to talk to you guys, kind of the takeaway, if you will. So the next slide, please, Mr. Ryan is that we've got a pool of people that are extremely talented and currently unemployed or underemployed. Um, they're more reliable, they're more dependable, they have better on task time and less turnover. That creates value to employers, right? So if you can hire somebody that you have to not spend as much on training, they're gonna be there more, they're gonna do better when they're actually working, they're more engaged and dependable, then a company saves money and it becomes more profitable. That person that we've got placed in the job is happy they found success. I mean, it's what every every company and everybody wants at that point. Um, we do all of that training here at TACT. We're trying to get tax in other states. So right now we're getting it set up. If you are interested in this and feel overwhelmed by it and you want to have somebody like us come out to your state and try to get an affiliate set up, that's what we're trying to do right now. We'd love to talk to you about that. Um, so we're trying right now here for Attack, for example, to, to work with all these different companies in Denver to funnel, funnel as many qualified candidates as possible. And it's working, right? And then when we go to companies, then we market it together. They're happy that they're hiring kids from our community. We're showcasing that these are real companies that are hiring. So for example, here in Denver, Sturgeon Electric, a big electrical company, they've hired a bunch of our electrical graduates. They're building the new I-70 project that goes through the whole city. They're writing all of the lights. Another electrical company called Wayfield has hired a bunch of our electrical students. They're building the new Amazon.com building. So when I'm talking about our kids getting jobs, these aren't entry level jobs. These are jobs that if you order from Amazon, our students will be the ones that have wired the building. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Um, so that's kind of it in a, in a 45 minute nutshell. Sorry if I talk so much, but I would love to take the last 15 minutes to answer as many questions from you um, as possible. Again, on this um, PowerPoint that um, we have, I've got all of the references for you all to see, so you can look up everything, all the publications that I referenced, um, as well as my contact information. If you feel like you would like to email me, um, again, visit our website, buildtac.org and um, phone numbers and stuff on there if you want to call. Um, I'm open book, so I would love to help in any way um, that I can. So, uh, Mr. Ryan, do we have anybody with some, any questions? Yeah, Danny, great job. So our first question, kind of a statement as well, says, uh, Danny, this is amazing. Are you considering licensing or fran uh, franchising your program? 
That would be very interesting and something I would consider pursuing. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, first, thanks. Um, so we're a nonprofit. Uh, so nonprofits can't franchise, but we affiliate. So yes, we are looking at um, having affiliates, and um, we would love to talk to that person about that. Um, it essentially it works where you would get um, all of the resources um, for funding, which we didn't even kind of go into, which is a whole big portion of all this. Tact is set up. I'm a parent, right? So um, I know how difficult this is for parents. So we are very, very grant dependent. And we work with agencies like Medicaid, we're a program approved service agency. So we've learned how to navigate all of these systems. And part of that is sharing that with you so that you can navigate those systems as well. So absolutely, um, we're looking at um, starting affiliates in other states. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. And the next question is, uh, where can I go to help support Danny's 501C? Great question. So um, on our website, um, buildwithtact.org, there's a donate um, page. So if you would like to make a donation, um, there's that. Um, you can see through GuideStar, we are um, a gold-rated transparency organization that um, we're very, very transparent, obviously, as a 501c3 of everything that we have and do with all of our resources. Um, we're very fortunate in the sense that we're growing. We have 12 staff members. Um, and um, we've been pretty successful, knock on wood. I mean, it's still nonprofit, so um, we need your help <laughs> in a very, very big way. Um, we want to take care of our staff and our, our kids. So um, any donation that you can do would be wonderful. And so you can donate through our website. There's secure portals to do all of that. That would be great. Thank you. Okay, and the next question. Uh, can you speak to some of the assessments you use in order to match the individual to careers that fit both preference and skill? Yeah, Thank that's you. a great, yeah, that's a great question. So um, we use a variety of different assessments and I'm so glad you asked that. It must be an educator or therapist out there. Um, so um, when we're doing it, we do an intake um, as part of our um, transition program. Um, ideally with the camps and workshops, if we have a client that we've had for years, it's self-feeding, right? So we've had the idea of a formative assessment with these individuals for years to see what they like. But if it's somebody that's just coming from a school district or just moved from the area, this year, for example, we had um, four clients that moved from out of state just to come to our program. Um, when they come, we set up times where it's a day and they'll meet with our director of education, um, myself or Becky Mershon, um, that does a great job with our, our all of our family communications. And um, we do a variety of different projects and we set it up where they're successful in every project, but we're watching for everything from fine motor to gross motor to communication to frustration tolerance to executive functioning. And then we have um, a bunch of different assessments that we've written um, that you can find out <laughs> if you become affiliate how we are doing that. Um, and then um, Children's Hospital is working with us as well. They've been a great partner and they're helping us assess it too. We're doing a three-year longitudinal study on how all well those assessments are working, especially with retention, um, whether once the kids are placed with jobs. And um, we're watching the kid and we're, or the young adult, and then um, we place them with that. The neat thing about our program is once you start automotive, it doesn't mean you have to stay in automotive. Once you start welding, it doesn't mean you have to stay. So sometimes we get it wrong um, where a kid will think, okay, this is what they want to do. And we noticed that and they're wrong. So here's an example. Um, we had a um, client come to us that said he wanted to do computer science, um, STEM stuff that we do with all kinds of um, computer aided drafting and drones and 3D printing, et cetera. And this client um, was having a hard time, but every 20 minutes he was needing a break and it was just becoming apparent. He wasn't enjoying it. The family wasn't as happy as well. Um, he kept peeking out the window at the carpentry class came out to a carpentry class and his very first class, he actually worked for three hours straight, just sanding. He loved it that much. Now he does carpentry full time. Um, we got him a job actually restoring desks for school districts. So, I mean, it's possible when you see and you're attentive to that. And again, through that, we've got a whole bunch of different graphs that we make and different studies. And we've got tons and tons of pretty graphs, line graphs and dot graphs and bar graphs and pie graphs that um, measured all that we present to everybody, um, especially with all our funding. But um, it's very much based upon um, those measures that we're looking at. I kind of hope that helps, but I'm happy to go over more of it if you'd like, um, if you want to email me. 
That's great. Okay, so our next question is, is there a partnership with state DOE, workforce, and VR? Yeah. Um, so um, we are partnered with the Colorado Department of Education. Um, and so we call it the CDE out here. And then um, our local um, voc rehab as well. Um, yes, um, also Medicaid. Um, those have been the hardest ones, honestly, for us. Uh, the Department of Education was the easiest one. Um, just with our levels of assessment and different things we've done. The Medicaid one um, took some some doing. I mean, in full transparency, even when we started this, we were turned down with insurance for 13 times, right? So insurance agencies looked at what we were doing and they're, they freaked out, right? I mean, the idea that we're putting all these um, tools in kids' hands um, made it very difficult to get started. So if you're wanting to start this too, part of the reason we want to do the affiliations is to help people figure out how to do that. It takes a lot of work. Um, the VOC Rehab um, took some time. Thankfully, they've got a new director. She's wonderful, um, and she's been a big proponent of our program and are now working with us in the work adjustment training, um, in the SWAP program as well, which is um, the school work adjustment um, placement. Um, and then we do job simulation stuff. So any of the um, supported employment pieces, like through Medicaid or the work adjustment training pieces through DVR, um end up working out okay and well um it doesn't honestly in full transparency and that's part of the reason um we rely so much on grants that people that are wanting to support it certainly does not pay enough to um pay a teacher um let alone actually provide the supports that we need but it does help supplement our program so they do support it and i'm happy to talk about how they do that they've been great with that all right and our next question uh, how many of your students or youth have significant communication and behavior needs that have hindered their workability? Any advice for others as they navigate the work world? Yeah, that's a great, great question. So we've been very fortunate, knock on wood, that what we find here at TAC and kind of, I think, the reason we've been successful in building a community, um, which is one of the big things you feel when you come here, is that our kids, I feel like, are recognized, in just my experience doing this, for the first time for their actual talent and ability, right? So we have clients that, for example, have been kicked out of entire school districts for um, discipline or behaviors um, that have had to have organizations bring outside supports where it's like, okay, this client comes in and they need literally three people around them at all times just to make sure they're not hurting themselves or others. Um, and what we found is when you're empowering this individual and you're showcasing it, I swear you could, and I don't know how you would measure this, but you can see it in their eyes when they're actually trusted, recognized for their talent and supported in it. I mean, it's like this weight is just released off their shoulders. I mean, just you, you can see it in their body language. I, I don't know how you would ever measure something like that. Um, but we have kids that have gone from literally kicked out of entire school districts. That example, I mean, it's, it's really happened where some of our partners would come to us and say, I don't feel comfortable with this kid. I mean, other autism groups would come to us and say, I don't feel comfortable with this kid, our young adult being in this program. And then when they see how successful they are, and now all of a sudden they're getting a job and their parents are reaching out talking about how their home life has changed. Um, I mean, I don't want to oversell it or make it sound like it's some kind of miracle. I mean, it, it's the talent of the kid, um, and it's just fantastic to be part of that process for that individual. Um, but it, it works, and I think that when you're doing something that's strengths-based, um, we've been very fortunate to be successful in that. Um, for the communication barriers, um, again, like the neat thing about the trades is so much of it is visual, right? I mean, so much of it is um, if you can look at the picture and copy it. Um, we have a whole bunch of kids and there's, if you go to our website, you'll see baskets that are for sale. They're made by a client that we got a job. Um, he's, um, he was at the time we got him the job, 21, now he's 23, um, where he makes these amazing baskets. Um, he uses his cell phone to communicate um, and he's, brilliant and like in the very first class he could read a tape measure down to the 16th of an inch he couldn't communicate it with you verbally how he was doing it we'd come up with these amazing designs and now he works for a um, company that makes baskets and they sell them to realtors and realtors buy them and they fill them with wine and cheese but he does enough with this that like 
he has a life and he's making an income. Um, he has to actually scale it back. One of the big hurdles has been that families, they'll make so much money that the families don't want them to lose their SSI. Um, so that's where he's at, where he's having to keep it scaled. So he doesn't, if he chooses that, um, to take that the next step, but it, it works. It really does. That's great. Okay. And our next question is what approach do you use to engage employers? Is it cold calling emails, et cetera? Yeah. Um, it's everything. Um, so we've been very fortunate. I mean, you know, there's so many, um, individuals right now with autism. It's a fair bet that, um, you know, somebody at one of these organizations has an employee that has a child with autism. It's, it's a, it's a pretty sure bet. Um, so a lot of our success has been sharing what we're doing and we're, we're very open. We, we want, I mean, we, we look at it as, again, as parents, right? So, um, Becky and myself will go out and we talk to all of these different, um, families about what we're doing, excuse me, other support groups. Um, the news has been very supportive. And a lot of times somebody at one of the organizations will see it and reach out and say, I work at this organization. Can I talk to you about it for my son? Um, but other than that, um, we've been very successful in the sense of um, showcasing the student's talent to the employers. So, and what I mean by that is uh, for our automotive program that has one of our big partners. Um, we have kids that are now putting airbags in Audis and Volvos. Um, I mean, real, I mean, real stuff that, I mean, it's incredible. Um, we've gone to a couple car shows in our auto program, for example. Um, these aren't small car shows. These are very, very large with hundreds and hundreds of cars. Uh, people come from all around and we won first place in both. Um, and these are classic cars. And then after we've won the two that we've entered and we won first place, after we won, then we said, okay, this was done by kids with autism. We went into it trying to showcase the talent, right? It seems maybe subtle, but all of a sudden when people are voting for it based on how good it is, rather than seeing like, look at this car that's restored by kids with autism, they're actually authentically looking at the talent. And then when they see it, they vote for it and wins. And then it's like, oh, oh hey, by the way, this person just has to, happens to have autism. Then it knocks down that barrier. And then all of a sudden it's, well, I run a garage. I want to car work have a car dealership, can I talk to you about hiring some of your kids? Because there's this huge deficit of mechanics. Um, and then some of them, it's literally just, just that cold calling. Um, I've called more people than I can possibly count, get turned down more times than I can possibly count. But once we found that they get hired into one, then like the Wayfield Electric, for example, um, that's now our students that are now building the new amazon.com building. Um, they went to the other electrical contractor, Sturgeon, for example, and said, we can't find workers. Where are you getting good candidates? And when that company says, hey, we're getting good kids from TACT, then all of a sudden they come to us and say, okay, I heard that you guys are putting out great kids. Can I talk to you about hiring some of your students? So it works that way as well, that kind of word of mouth, which is a pretty cool place to be. That's great. All right. We have about five more minutes for questions. And our next one is, how do you get parents to back off and let their sons or daughters decide their own goals? I work with young adults in a work training program who want one thing. The parent yeah. pushes another one uh, that they feel is quote unquote better. Yeah. No, honestly, that that's, and I can completely feel your pain. I mean, our, our parents are wonderful and the parent, um, as two, but that's honestly been one of our, our biggest hurdles, um, just completely transparently, like uh, that. And then the SSI thing that I mentioned as well, where, you know, because these jobs pay so well, that if you are making a certain amount of money per year, you no longer qualify for certain benefits. So that families will come to us and say, I don't want my kid to have this um, job that pays this well, because then they'll lose this, these benefit programs or these government programs. Um, that's been one of the biggest hurdles for us, um, is convincing parents that it's okay too. I mean, it's amazing that you can uh, convince an employer to put airbags in a car on a Volvo that costs 60 grand easier than you can convince a parent that their own child can do it. Um, but that's been a big barrier. I mean, the biggest thing for us has just been patience and consistency. I mean, um, to the point that we've had to like, just personally step back because we were responding to emails or phone calls at 11 o'clock at night and weekends and all those kind of things. And it just, it's tiring. So, um, and I'm sure whoever asked that question, you know exactly what I'm talking about. 
So um, we try to set it up where we just keep showcasing again those projects of success and then let the employer, once that client or student has gotten hired, we'll talk about it as well as like, you know, this is a job, it can't be guaranteed forever. However, your child or is succeeding, there's all these opportunities for advancement. And then it just becomes like everybody where it's a gamble at that point, um, if that's gonna be your future. Um, so um, patience, <laughs> that's my recommendation. Patience and, and coffee, patience and coffee. So there you go. Great pro tip. Yeah. All right, our next one is, uh, thanks for the great presentation, Danny, first off. Given that many trade programs, community college programs are not autism specific in many communities, what yeah. tips or suggestions would you give to parents or individuals if they would like to try to engage with training opportunities within their own community? That's a great question. So the hardest thing that we found for the traditional trade programs, because they're, I mean, the idea of a trade school is, is nothing new, is that the class size is going to be hard. Um, you know, when you have, again, I mentioned the one that had the 30 to 60 kids in the garage, that's a lot of them, right? So um, in my experience, what I've seen so far that that kind of setup just by design for any anybody, it's very difficult for any child or young adult to be successful in a classroom where if it's 90 minutes, like a public school, and there's 30 kids per class, and you're getting actually three minutes of teacher time or a couple minutes of teacher time, that's that, that's nothing. You're, it doesn't really learn. So I would talk to um, the teachers to see if there's opportunities to bring in um, a support staff of some sort, um, whether it's a behavioralist or a RBT or a therapist or an advocate or a job coach to be there. For parents, I would encourage just trying things at home with your kids in the garage. I mean, um, we have kids, we teach kids that don't just have autism, that have down syndrome that have other intellectual and developmental disabilities and delays and um, we encourage them you know go on craigslist and look for free lawnmowers and go out and take the blade off the back and have them take them apart and put them together and then if it doesn't do it then take it to the recycling center um, there's all kinds of things that we can do at home to start getting our kids to try to do things um, it does take that energy but a lot of times especially with things like Craigslist, you can get free things all day long to try and let your kids start experiencing them. Um, but I think just communicating it um, and then be willing to let them fail. I mean, be willing to let them try it at home, in the garage, in a space where they feel comfortable and safe and see if that works. And then um, if they are still showing interest, um, you can talk to other people, but we can always help too. So if you have other questions, I'm happy to help. That's great. All right, Danny, this is going to be our last question today, and it's a great one. Uh, what do you think is the most rewarding part of your job? That's a great question. I think the most rewarding part, the thing that fills me up the most is, again, when kids recognize it for themselves. I know just as a parent, you can, my son's very, very aware when he's in an IEP meeting and he hears the teacher's talking about his deficits rather than his assets. Um, here at TACT, when you see the kids recognized for the things that they're creating, for the way that they think, for the way that they see the world, and they get that they're in a community that sees that it has value. Again, I, I wish there was some way to measure seeing somebody's joy and happiness. And when we have kids that won't go to you know, regular school, but they'll come here openly, quickly, when parents can't keep them out of the door, when they want to stay late, um, you know that it's working. And I think just that level of empowerment. And then when you visit these kids and young adults on the job, I mean, it's just, it's, it's empowering. I mean, that, that's my favorite part is knowing that we're helping kids for the first time, sadly, realize that they are incredible and that they have a lot to offer and that this diagnosis of autism isn't gonna be something that's gonna hold them back, that they, they can do it and we're gonna help them get there. And I think that um, it's the best part of the job. And then, um, yeah, it's what keeps you going, knowing you're making a difference for that. That's great. So thank you. Uh, that is all we have time for today, everyone. Thank you, Danny, and thank you to everyone for joining us today.
Want to let you know, once you close out of the event, you will receive an exit survey. We would appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback. Everyone will receive a follow-up email with a link to today's video recording and your materials within one week, within the week. On behalf of the Organization for Autism Research, thank you for joining us and please have a great rest of your day. Thank you all.